So thank you all for joining me. Um, before I begin, I wish to acknowledge the traditional and unceded territories of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandot, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe nations in what we now call the state of Ohio. This land is still home to many indigenous peoples today across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work and live on this land. And while I acknowledge that a land acknowledgement is never enough, it's an important social justice step in a decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are on settled indigenous lands here. I also wanna thank Zarina Jurokolova and Nali for the, all their amazing hard work to put this talk together tonight. The seminar series, the provost's office, and Leslie and Joseph from um, ITS for helping do all the wizardry behind the scenes to make this happen tonight. And then finally to all of you in person and online who are joining us tonight. So I've organized my talk into basically four parts, looking at what is and what isn't critical race theory, looking at some of the national debates around critical race theory and the kind of broader social justice, um, anti-racist landscape at the moment, specifically diving into House Bill 327, which is one of the two bills currently in the Ohio State House dealing with uh, banning of divisive concepts in public schools across Ohio. And then since I'm teaching in an international studies program, try to wrap up by thinking about what are some of the broader global implications um, of this story. So what is critical race theory? I don't assume everyone here already knows that answer, so I wanna to touch on that very briefly. So Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanik, who published the book you can see there, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, are probably two of the more well-known critical race theory scholars today, and they provide a useful definition that you can see here. Critical race theory, or the CRT movement, is a collection of activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationships among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up, but place them in a broader perspective that includes economics, history, setting, group, and self-interest, and emotions and the unconscious. And unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which stresses what they describe as incremental and step-by-step -step progress, um, critical race theory really tries to get at the very foundation of the liberal order, including ideas like equality theory, legal reasoning, the enlightenment rationalism, and the idea of neutral principles of constitutional law. Um, similarly, legal scholars uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and her authors who published this uh, key writings book talk about the idea of critical race theory, particularly in its early days, is trying to show how law was a constitutive element of race itself. In other words, how law constructed race. And they argue that a key task of critical race theory today is to remind us how deeply issues of racial ideology and power continue to matter in American life, especially as they note in the aftermath of what they call the age of repudiation in the 1990s, which they describe as marking the rejection of the always fragile civil rights uh, consensus that had emerged, and the idea that governments not only can, but must play an active role in identifying and eradicating racial injustice. So as a method of analysis, critical race theory helps us to uncover the complex histories and power relationships that underlie the construction of social categories like race or class or gender through laws and social norms. And then having done that, we can use that knowledge to critically evaluate and expose how power constructs specific forms of social relationships. For example, when we say that race is socially constructed, what do we mean? Well, we mean that that idea of race the idea of being white or being black in the United States, for example, has a very distinct genealogy that you can trace, and we can show how race as a social category came into existence, changed and evolved over time, such as, for example, how Jews became white or how the Irish became white through processes of immigration and integration into the American sort of story. But this is important. To say that race is constructed is not to say that race is just an imaginary idea because we know that ideas do have very real material consequences. So what, what I wanna argue that critical race theory as an analytic lens helps us to do is to uncover how these expressions of social power operate, look at whose interests do they serve, and how have these dynamics changed over time. And critical race theory as sort of a broader political movement tries to call our attention to and to help us see these issues more clearly. So for example, as Delgado and Stefanik note, um, CRT as both a method 
of scholarly analysis, as well as a kind of critical intellectual movement builds on these insights in order to try to bring about social change. Now, briefly, there's kind of a long history behind how critical race theory emerged today. I'm not gonna go into that whole long genealogy, um, but give you very kind of a brief overview. So in the 1920s and the 1930s, you have the legal realism movement. And out of that sort of era of the 20s and 30s, you have critical theory emerging from the Frankfurt School, scholars, primarily Jewish scholars in Germany, before uh, the beginning of Nazism, and then uh, later moving to New York City and other places afterwards. 1970s, the emergence of critical legal studies, or CLS, and then coming out particularly of that 70s movement in the 1980s, critical race theory. And these ideas, if you're interested in learning more about them, that key writings uh, that form the movement book that I showed earlier that um, Kimberly Crenshaw, Neil Gatanda, Gary Peller, and Kendall Thomas um, co-authored, has a lot of that rich history for folks that may be interested. So delve into that if you'd like to know a little bit more about that story. And today there are literally thousands of different scholars who draw on critical race theory insights and their analysis has expanded far beyond just the original focus on law. Um, but because CRT is such a diverse movement and approach embraced by a lot of different scholars in different fields using slightly different approaches, it's hard to come up with one single definition that everybody agrees on. Um, but even within that kind of diversity of approaches, um, Stefanik and Delgado talk about sort of some basic tenets that they see um, kind of binding critical race theory scholars together. This first one is the idea that racism itself is an ordinary part of the American experience. It's not something exceptional. It's sort of hard baked um, into society. When we talk about systemic racism, that's what we're talking about. It's systemic to the um, United States in particular. And it underlies the experience not only of people of color, but of diverse immigrant communities in the United States. Second idea is that racial hierarchies that exist um, and have come to be created in the United States serve both important material and sort of psychic uh, purposes or functions within society, particularly for uh, white elites, so it's a very material purpose, maintaining their economic position in society. But also for working class whites, it provides kind of a psychic story that allows them to say, well, I may be doing bad, but I'm not as bad as that black person. Right? So it keeps them in a position where they want to uphold whiteness because they see a financial benefit themselves, as well as a psychic benefit of saying, I could be worse off like some other group. The third idea, which I mentioned briefly, is this idea that race itself is a social construct. It's not rooted in anything biological or fixed. Fourth idea is this kind of understanding that the effects of what they call in the literature um, differential racialization, so how Dominant society racializes different groups at different times in response to shifting social norms. So we can think about it different periods in US history. We have sort of the yellow menace and anti-Chinese and anti-Asian sentiments. At other periods, we have anti-Irish or anti-Jewish, um, right? Different periods of history, different groups are brought into or out of the fold as is politically expedient. And the fifth one is the importance of an intersectional and sort of an anti-essentialist argument. So the idea that no person has a single fixed identity and that different aspects of our identities are not only overlapping, but also intersecting and are constantly always in flux. And this is something that um, Kimberly Crenshaw and other um, sort of feminist scholars have built on and developed um, extensively since the 1970s and 1980s. And finally, the last one is that the idea that um, people of color and communities of color, particularly scholars, bring a distinctive voice and lived experience to talking about race in America. And as uh, they note, sometimes this is kind of in an uneasy tension with ideas of anti-essentialism, um, but it's also been an important part of the sort of legal storytelling movement that's been emerging um, out of critical race theory, talking about lived experience and how that manifests um, through law and other social experiences. Now, this is obviously a very cursory review of some of the basic ideas um, that you might encounter while studying critical race theory. And obviously, a more nuanced and rich discussion um, is beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but fortunately, here at Denison, the Center for Black Studies is hosting a whole year-long seminar series on critical race theory. There was just one on Friday of last week. Um, so check those out if you want to get more sort of information and context and details about these conversations going on. Okay, so if that's a little bit about what critical race theory is, what critical race theory is not? What isn't it? So it's important to note at the outset, particularly in the context of Ohio and the politics we're talking about here, 
that usually you're not going to encounter critical race theory until you're in college and often in grad school or law school. And there's this kind of circulating myth that first graders are being indoctrinated in critical race theory. Um, but even an eighth grader probably doesn't have the background and capacities to do detailed historical, legal, textual analysis the way that critical race theory scholars are doing. Now, in schools, they may be and very much are engaging with issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion, kind of broadly DEI, as it's often called in the universities. But this is not the same thing as being taught critical race theory. And this is a point that critics often kind of do a sleight of hand and say, oh, they're talking about diversity, they're talking about racism, they're doing critical race theory. But they're not the same thing, and that point needs to be sort of mentioned over and over and over again. It's not to say that we perhaps shouldn't be teaching critical race theory, but in elementary schools, we're certainly not doing that. And as Ohio educators who have been testifying and writing about these current bills um, have noted, their engagements with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classrooms are being done in an age-appropriate way, following state standards, and using curriculum that the local school districts have approved. So there's already a lot of mechanisms in place to look at and review what's being used in the classrooms. Now, I also want to point out that none of the legislation in Ohio, interestingly, actually references critical race theory anywhere. So it's kind of a attack through the back door rather than being very explicit about what these bills are meant to focus on. But if you listen to the testimony of supporters and um, sponsors of the bills, it's quite clear that the actual target of legislation like House Bill 322 or 327 is to target what they view as the indoctrination of children through critical race theory in public schools. So here are some of the common claims that um, I've heard come up in different situations. Critical race theory is a covert attack on the core American values, including Christianity, capitalism, individualism, nationalism, the family, and marriage. CRT undermines American democracy and seeks to create a Marxist state or promote what they describe as a Marxist cultural agenda that both shames white people and promotes black victimization. In contrast to those, we see arguments that critical race theory itself is a form of reverse racism against white people. There's arguments that systemic or structural racism, ideas like implicit bias or white privilege don't actually exist at all. They're entirely false and made up. That we live in a colorblind or post-racial society in the United States, and everyone treats everyone else equally. I call this the MLK myth that we hear repeated over and over in public testimonies. The idea that social and economic progress in the United States operates based on meritocracy. This is the classic Reagan era, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you work hard and you'll be able to get forward in life, regardless of your situation. And then finally, and perhaps most interestingly, the idea that anyone critical of Christianity or free market capitalism or this sort of broader conservative narrative of US history that goes into many of these frameworks is itself an ideological threat, a domestic enemy comes from evil people who are spreading a poison throughout society. And so this is the kind of discourse we're seeing um, being argued in these different um, public hearings and op-eds and newspapers and in other sort of venues. So how did we get to this point um, in America, in Ohio, where this is the conversation and the discussion we're having? Well, a couple kind of key moments I think are worth highlighting. So with the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012, shortly after we have the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement between 2013 and 2014, responding to a whole wave of additional killings, primarily of young black men, but also young black women, Latina men, Latino women. In August of 2019, so I'm jumping a bit there, but looking at kind of key moments, the 1619 Project is released by the New York Times, which becomes a flashpoint about debates over teaching history in America. Summer of 2020, as many of you will likely remember, um, Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor are all killed. In the summer of that same year in 2020 here in Ohio, the Ohio Board of Education passes Resolution 20, which encourages the state to take seriously issues of racism in the schools and encourages the Department of Education to try to think about how internally and through curriculum they can address these issues in Ohio. In November the 2nd, um, just before the elections, President Trump creates the Advisory 1776 Committee as a response to the New York Times and the 1619 Project report, trying to sort of rewrite history, um, if you will. A few days later, Biden is announced as the 46th president after the elections. 
Uh, as you all know, January 6th, we had the mob insurrection uh, trying to reject the counting and election of votes in the Capitol. Then in May of this year, we had both House Bill 322 and 327 introduced, trying to ban the teaching of these divisive concepts. And you had the Ohio Attorney General David Yost, as well as approximately 20 other state attorney generals, all sign and send a letter to the Department of Education telling them that they were opposed to the use of anything having to do with critical race theory in the sort of national educational system, curriculum, um, et cetera. And so in, in researching this topic and trying to think about these histories, I've identified what I would describe as sort of three different streams or political tributaries that I think are responsible um, for this kind of current anti-CRT fervor. Um, the first source is probably the one that's the most obvious and unsurprising, and that's just good old fashioned anti-black racism. And it's been around for 500 years. There's lots of comments in public debates that I've read or listened to um, that make it clear that opposition to critical race theory and more broadly social justice education, anti-racist anti and social justice kind of curriculum is seen as part of the problem itself in America right now. So there's a pushback against all of these ideas that have been in a sense made possible by the opening from these mass social movements, Black Lives Matter and to an important but lesser extent, even um, the Me Too movement. And so in many ways, CRT is just the latest target of this white rage um, and sort of conservative furor and backlash. And importantly, it also has deep and sort of uh, worrying roots in white Christian nationalism. And I'll come back to that in just a bit. Now, the second source of anti-critical race theory sentiment is coming from a small but extremely powerful group of right-wing think tanks policy and research centers that have been slowly consolidating their power since the 1980s. Um, the ideas and the documents and the research they're producing then trickles down to local levels across all of the states and is backed up and supported by some of the big think tanks such as Cato, Heritage Foundation, and is funded through all of these dark money webs that the Koch brothers and ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, um, are running and operating in at essentially every level of the United States. And the second stream, importantly, has been the one that's been the most effective politically in mobilizing people, particularly at the level of school boards, state districts, and um, school state uh, boards of education. And many of these groups are behind what in sort of the political science world we talk about as um, astroturf groups or astroturfing. So basically creating a fake front, front group that you provide money and funding and talking points for to make it seem like there's this broad grassroots um, opposition and when in fact many of it is being organized um, from quite on high. So for example, here in Ohio, some of the groups that have been testifying in support of both 322 and 327, groups like the National Association of Scholars, Ethics and Public Policy Center, Rocky River Citizens for Transparency, Protect Ohio's Children Coalition, Ohio Value Voters, Center for Christian Virtue, Ohio Christian Alliance, Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, MU Educational Leadership, Parents Defending Education, Parents' Rights in Education, Freedom Works, Moms for Liberty, and No Left Turn in Education. Now, Parents Defending Education, just to give you one kind of concrete example, has an indoctrination map on their website where you can track where our students are being indoctrinated across the nation. And here in Ohio, there are uh, four parent groups and five incidents that have been filed focusing on Gahanna Jefferson Public Schools, Olentangy Schools, Shaker Heights Schools, and Columbus Academy. And they range from uh, my student was given a handout that talked about equity and diversity, to uh, my students were wrestling with white privilege in a reading um, in a class, to someone saying, well, the Columbus Academy refuses to give us the training materials that an outside um, diversity training group used to do a staff and faculty training. In all these examples, it's really hard to underestimate just how important groups like ALEC and these other sort of um, media personalities on the political right have been in driving these sort of narratives. And this kind of final stream draws very much on these groups for ideas coming from bloggers, writers, um, various media pundits and podcasters, as well as political allies and positions of power from the presidency down um, to local and state levels. And these also include established voices that many of you are familiar with, people like Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity on Fox News, but also maybe some you're not as familiar with, such as Christopher Rufo and Mark Levine. 
So for example, this past summer, journalist Benjamin Wallach Wells, who writes for The New Yorker, did an expose titled How, to, How a Conservative Activist Invented the Conflict Over Critical Race Theory. And it's a long and detailed article, but part of the highlight from that is that Rufo explains that conservative right media activists decided they need a new way to get at attacking this broader movement for justice that had been emerging and expanding over the course of the summer of 2020. And as he notes there in this quote, critical race theory provided the perfect villain to paint all of these issues under one single kind of catchphrase. But rather than focusing on Rufo, who's gotten a lot of media attention in the last uh, sort of year or so, I want to talk about someone who hasn't uh, got as much attention in kind of mainstream press as he gets lots in the right wing um, sort of media, and that's Mark Levine. So earlier this summer, his book American Marxism came out. I believe it's his seventh book at this point that he's written. And he's made a career of uh, right wing talking points, but more importantly, making the argument that there's a broad and covert takeover of America by this Marxist cultural agenda, which this book sort of is the summary of that uh, sort of consolidation of that argument he's been making in different ways in other books. And in his view, the effort by the left to impose cultural Marxism on an unsuspecting public seeks to destroy democracy and turn the US into a Marxist dictatorship. And while personally I find these claims rather ludicrous, um, they also closely match many of the talking points that we are hearing in local school boards and legislatures both in Ohio and across the country in these debates about CRT in schools. So this book here you can see came out this year. Importantly, and this is one of the reasons I'm focusing on it, has been on the New York Times bestseller list for 11 weeks. It was number one until last week. It's now been bumped to third as two new books came out, one about Trump and one about the Vanderbilts, I believe. Everyone loves exposés on the rich and famous. And importantly, not only was it on the number one list for 11 weeks, as of September of this year, so just a few, weeks, a few days ago, it had sold over a million copies, was in, I believe, the 13th printing, and it continues to appear on the best-selling list of USA Today, Publishers Weekly, and the Wall Street Journal. So these ideas are being disseminated quite broadly across the American public right now, both hardback and in ebook forms. So here's how the publishers describe this book. In American Marxism, Levine seeks to rally the American public to defend their liberty, traditions, family, and the Constitution from a counter-revolution to the American Revolution that seeks to destroy the existing civil society. Levine explains how the core elements of Marxist ideology have been uniquely tailored to and applied to American society and are now pervasive throughout the culture, forming a variety of sub-movements surrounding issues such as climate change, genderism, and critical race theory. As Levine writes in the opening to American Marxism, in America, many Marxists cloak themselves in phrases like progressives, democratic socialists, social activists, community activists, as most Americans remain openly hostile to the name Marxism. They operate under myriad newly minted organizational or identifying nomenclature such as Black Lives Matter, Antifa, the squad, and they claim to promote economic justice, environmental justice, racial equity, gender equity, and they've invented new theories like critical race theory and phrases and terminologies linked to or fit into a Marxist construct. Moreover, they claim the quote, dominant culture and capitalist systems are unjust and inequitable, racist and sexist, colonialist and imperialist, materialist and destructive of the environment. Of course, the purpose is to tear down and tear apart the nation for a thousand reasons in a thousand different ways, thereby dispiriting and demoralizing the public, undermining the citizenry's confidence in the nation's institutions, traditions, and customs, creating one calamity after another, weakening the nation from within, and ultimately destroying what we know as American republicanism and capitalism. In the specific chapter in the book, focused on racism, genderism, and Marxism, um, Levine lays out kind of his most focused attack on CRT, which in his words is one of the most destructive ideologies today. He says, CRT is an insidious and racist Marxist ideology spreading throughout our culture and society. 
And then citing a Heritage Foundation report from earlier this past year called The New Intolerance and its Grip on America, he described some of the supposedly um, central ideas of CRT that are being promoted. And these are some of these ideas. That a Marxist analysis of society made up of categories of oppressors and oppressed is the only way to understand the world. The idea that the impressed impede revolution when they adhere to the cultural beliefs of their oppressors and they must be put through re-education sessions. So these are what the CRT staff trainings are in their mind. Um, the concomitant need to dismantle all societal norms through relentless criticism. And the replacement of all systems of power and even the description of those systems with a worldview that describes only oppressors and oppressed. So if you're reading his books, listening to this sort of rhetoric, um, this is what you think CRT is doing to our children um, in schools. Now, interestingly, he then goes on to describe Robin DiAngelo, who wrote White Fragility, and Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote, among others, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he describes them as the two best-selling proponents of CRT. Now, for those of you who are actually familiar with CRT research and scholarship, this is a rather puzzling claim because neither D'Angelo nor Kendi do critical race theory. In fact, if you read their books, critical race theory or CRT do not appear one single time in either book. So this got me wondering, how exactly does one become a best-selling uh, proponent of critical race theory without even mentioning the concept in your work? I mean, for those of you that are you know, faculty or educators out there, it's, it's, it's quite an amazing feat. You know, I wish personally that I could take intellectual credit as a thought leader in a field that I'd never done any work in. That would be amazing. That would make tenure so much easier. But that's not how it works. And Levine also develops considerable space to this sort of argument about the threats of CRT in schools and how it's infiltrating this Marxist cultural agenda. And mother, among other things, he claims, today publishers are pushing out books on CRT at a brisk pace. Educational materials are being used in public school classrooms throughout America to indoctrinate and brainwash children. School teachers are being, quote, re-educated and trained in critical race theory. CRT is now firmly entrenched in American universities and colleges, and its reach is widespread. He continues, moreover, CRT is spreading rapidly throughout America's public schools. Among other things, this is being accomplished with the strong advocacy and corporate machinery of the New York Times and the 1619 Project. So you see again the reference to the 1619 Project here. So I wanna turn a little bit to what some people here in Ohio have been saying as they've been testifying about this bill and before we dive into the substance of it. So for example, House Bill 327 supporter, Katherine Johnson stated in her testimony before the state um, and local government committee, which is the subcommittee of the House where the bill is currently being heard in. She argues CRT is identity politics by intentional promotion of cultural Marxism that threatens to subvert the progress and hope of this great nation. This is a movement that pounds out the pillars of unity, faith, family, and love of country. Similarly, Michael Goldstein of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, who actually worked kind of behind the scenes with Representative Grindel to help craft some of um, House Bill 327, stated when he came to testify in support of the bill um, that he felt strongly that substitute House Bill 327, there was a change to it, so now the substitute is the current version. Um, it's a good first step in combating the indoctrination of our students with this pernicious doctrine whose adherents are using our own children to destroy the American project and replace it with a Marxist state. And this could have been lifted literally out of Levine's book. And Goldstein went on to add in his kind of impromptu remarks to a question from another one of the representatives he said, I will say that I believe critical race theory is an unmitigated attack on the United States Constitution by getting rid of all rights, which is what they want to do. And I see my job as someone who has taken the oath several times to protect and defend the Constitution of the U.S. from all enemies, foreign and domestic. An unmitigated attack on the Constitution is created by an enemy, a domestic enemy of the United States. That's how I feel about it. So now critical race theory proponents are domestic enemies of the United States. Another supporter, um, Deb Jeal, offers what I would argue is a relatively unfiltered version of these anti-CRT um, sort of opinions that Levine and others have been peddling and shows how these different ideas are operating across. So she says, CRT is not just about race. 
It's also about gender, sexuality, and any other victimized class for which the political left carries a banner. CRT indoctrinates all children to look at everything through a race-first lens. White children are asked to examine their whiteness and check their privilege. It's an anti-American doctrine, has no place in any Ohio school. The core of CRT is that white people are oppressors and irredeemable, and any race other than white are the oppressed and losers of society. It's a package of hate speech wrapped in the lies of the idea that systemic racism infects all forms of American life. This is a, false, this is a falsehood and should not be taught in our school systems. It goes totally against what Martin Luther King Jr. preached, that we should support the principles of equality, not equity, and that we need to evaluate each other on our personal character rather than the color of our skin. Now proponents of CRT say that Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech was racist. Absolutely unbelievable! And as she's saying this, she's quite adamant um, about that last part there. She goes on uh, to talk about how people that are supporting this are evil, and um, importantly, she says, but guess what? And she kind of looks around the room as she's saying this. The good people are no longer afraid. We, and you can see us here, and she's kind of pointing to the people in the room testifying, and all across the country, are gathering to fight the evil people, and they are going down. And she's quite adamant when she says this. All right now, for some reason, I, I don't understand this, um, white folks who are attacking critical race theory in these public hearings, they love to quote Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, um, as if somehow that were proof that Dr. King was opposed to calls for racial equity. And I have to kind of uh, hold myself back, but I always want to hand them a copy of Dr. King's final essay, A Testament to Hope, that came out after he died, where he wrote this. In these trying circumstances, the black revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, materialism, and mat militarism. It's exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals a systemic rather than a superficial flaw and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the issue to be faced. But somehow that version of Dr. King never seems to make it into these hearings. Now, over the years, Teaching, I found that a good way to help sort of my students get into some of these, what can be sometimes more abstract concepts, um, is to give you very specific concrete examples. So with that in mind, I wanna look at a final set of comments um, on this bill from the June 2021 hearing. And in my mind, at least, these remarks really kind of highlight what happens when um, white folks don't learn accurate political history and then perpetuate that same false and inaccurate history in US school systems. So Lisa Wood is a middle-aged white woman, Republican from Medina County, who supports House Bill 327. From 2007 to 2021, she was an elected member of the Ohio Board of Education, representing District 5, which is in North, sort of central Ohio. 2016, she ran as a Republican candidate in District 70 for the Ohio House of Representatives, but lost. And then in 2020, she ran for re-election to the Ohio Board of Education, um, but also lost. Together with her husband in 2008, they founded the Medina County Friends and Neighbors, or McFan. And according to their Facebook page, the mission of McFan is to build the conservative grassroots in Medina County, which is in Northern Ohio, and mobilize the silent majority. We do this in order to preserve, promote the constitutional republic, free enterprise economy, and our traditional American values. Now, I chose her for a very specific reason, which is she was a member of the Ohio Board of Education in charge of overseeing public education in Ohio, and if she hadn't lost, would be in that position again um, for a number of years. So this is part of what she said. Currently, there's a myth being propagated that critical race theory, an avowedly racist creed that is destructive and detrimental to Ohioans as any other, does not really exist, is not being thrust upon our school children, and is just, quote, a different way of thinking. Nothing could be further from the truth. I have heard these spurious arguments for some time now, and I'm here to tell you that critical race theory is being injected into schools through teacher professional development by ODE itself, Ohio Department of Education, and I am one of the people who, quote, voluntarily was indoctrinated. So as a member of the board, she had to go through some kind of a diversity training. And then importantly, and this is the quote I have up here, organized racism, which is really what CRT is, starts out subtly. The CRT adherents start out with outrageous lies that become more outrageous as they go along. 
Systematic racism is one of those outright lies. Let me assert the truth here. In order for Ohio to have committed the crime of systemic racism, a system of racism has to have been set in place either by law, rule, or practice. In all of our history, Ohio has never done this and currently does not do this. No US Supreme Court decision has ever held Ohio law or rule to be part of a system of racism. The same cannot be said for the 13 US states where slavery was legal. But Ohio is not one of those. In our long history since 1803, those of you who don't know, 1803 is when Ohio became a state. In our long history since 1803, Ohio has always granted equal rights to people regardless of race. The Northwest Territory explicitly states that slavery was not legal, nor to be tolerated. And Ohio was the crown gem of the Underground Railroad and proudly involved in the abolition movement. Ohio's votes elected Lincoln and abolitionist Republicans to office to right the wrongs of the Southern states. Now, when I heard her say this during the testimony in the State House, uh, my jaw hit the floor. I thought, this woman is on the Board of Education in Ohio, and she just said that. <sighs> well, let me just say that her claim to assert the truth wouldn't even have passed my seventh grade Ohio history class. Um, but George Orwell is helpful here. He reminds us that who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. So let's take a look at some of these real truths about Ohio history. July 13, 1787, the Confederation Congress passed an ordinance for the government of the territory of the United States, northwest of the River Ohio, which you more commonly know as the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Now, while it's true that Article 6 of the Northwest Ordinance declared, quote, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory, that part of her claim appears to be correct. But if you read beyond the comma there in that sentence, it continues by declaring, quote, that slavery was allowed in the punishment of crimes, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, and then importantly here, provided always that any person escaping into the same from who labor or service is lawfully claimed in any one of the original states, such fugitive may be lawfully reclaimed and conveyed to the person claiming his or her labor or service aforesaid. So right there, in the very founding of the Northwest Territory, slavery was already part of Ohio's DNA, even before Ohio was a state. Now, I want to call attention to this for two reasons. First, slavery was permitted, was permitted, as a crime, sorry, as a punishment for crime. And we've seen just how damaging that would become in later language of the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, was ratified in 1865. With the institution of chattel slavery being abolished, at the same time, a loophole was created that allowed slavery to continue to exist if it was as punishment, prison convict labor. For those of you that have seen the award-winning Netflix documentary, The 13th, it goes into this history in extensive detail. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. So that's the first factual point. Slavery was not banned in the Northwest Territories or the soon-to-be state of Ohio. It was only partly banned. Secondly, we need to pay attention to the second half of the Article 6 of that Northwest Ordinance, which, just to refresh your memory, stated that any person escaping into the same from whom labor or service is lawfully claimed in any one of the original states, being the southern states, such fugitive may be lawfully reclaimed and conveyed to the person claiming his or her labor or service as aforesaid. So what we're talking about here is guaranteeing a right of southern slaveholders to come into Ohio and take blacks who have run away from slavery and bring them back. Right? That's what that article is doing. It also makes sure that that white slaveholder power in the South is not challenged in the new territories that are being formed, particularly those across the Ohio River, which or River Jordan as it was sometimes referred to, because it was a key part of what would emerge as the Underground Railroad. And that was bad for Ohio business. You don't want all of your southern friends to think that you're going to make their lives harder. So you've got to find a way to provide for these loopholes. And let's not forget, importantly, that moving slaves and other goods along the Ohio River was critical to both the Ohio country, as it was called at that time, and the southern economy more broadly. Remember, many of the settlers of Ohio were themselves southern slave owners or southerners who were raised in that mentality.
Now, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 laid the foundation for Ohio to become a state, a state that protected the privileges and injustices of Southern white supremacists and slave traders, as I've just mentioned. And that doesn't even include the broader history that we have to keep in mind when we think about how Ohio came to be. Three-fifths compromise during the 1787 Constitutional Convention. 1789 Fugitive Slave Clause, or the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act. All of these are part of that broader historical background that can't be separated out from Ohio's founding. Now, if you go back and read the transcripts of the 1802 Ohio Constitutional Convention debates, which I have, they're a bit dry, but interesting, you'll find a revealing set of debates about slavery in Ohio, and also that it was a slim majority who were in favor of keeping slavery out of Ohio. Now, obviously, I'm not gonna go into a deep dive of Ohio constitutional history here, um, but what I wanna point out is that Lisa Wood's claim that in order for Ohio to have committed the crime of systemic racism, a system of racism has to have been set in place either by law, rule, or practice. The Ohio Constitutional Convention of 1802 debated the issue of slavery in some detail. And while they did agree not to become a slave state, the decision, as I said, was only passed by a slim majority. And many other restrictions were put into the Ohio Constitution. This helps explain why, for example, the 1803 Constitution, Article 4 on Elections and Electors, Section 1, limits the voting rights to, quote, all white male inhabitants above the age of 21 years, having resided in the state one year next preceding the election, and who have paid or are charged with a state or country tax. But early whites weren't content to stop right there, as Stephen Middleton, who's written extensively about black laws in the Northwest Territory, notes, Ohioans elected a conservative band of politicians to the State General Assembly in 1803, and beginning in 1804, legislators produced what were known as the Black Laws. First, the legislator attempted to discourage blacks from migrating to Ohio. Statutes in both 1804 and 1807 required newcomers to show proof of freedom as a condition for settlement and employment, and compelled residents to comply fully with federal fugitive slave law of 1793 and the state's black employment policies. A list of black laws followed denying African Americans access to public schools, welfare programs, suffrage, military service, jury service, and the ability to testify against a white in court. By adopting all of these policies, Ohio demonstrated to its neighbors across the Ohio River that it would not offer refuge to runaway slaves. Ohio had strong feelings against African Americans, Middleton argues. Whites did not want to offer them refugee status because of their race. So other than the absence of de jure slavery, therefore Ohio offered few amenities to African Americans. And there's lots of other examples we could look at. 1829, 1841, and many instances before and after that, there were white mobs that attacked black communities in Cincinnati. 1834, you had the Lane Seminary debates over slavery taking place in Cincinnati. In 1858, you had the famous Oberlin Wellington Rescue. All of this taking place without de jure slavery in Ohio. Blacks still lived under fear of white mob violence, slave catchers, and the constant threat of both public and private harassment with no legal recourse. Now, for those of you that may be unfamiliar with the 1858 Oberlin Wellington um, rescue story, briefly it involved um, John Price, who was a black slave who had escaped into the north to Oberlin in sort of northwestern Ohio. He was arrested in the city of Oberlin through a ruse by slave catchers and a marshal who had identified him as one of the runaway slaves. They boarded a train and started to take him to Wellington, another nearby town. A bunch of the Oberlin abolitionists, Oberlin was one of the centers of abolitionism at that time, basically ran over to Wellington with arms, forcibly freed Price, took him back to Oberlin, and then sent him off um, via secret routes to freedom in Canada. 37 people were arrested, and the case received major national attention. And one important outcome of that event was that the 1859 Ohio Republican Convention, abolitionists and their allies added repeal of the fugitive slave law, which had allowed the marshal and the slave catchers to come into Oberlin in the first place, to add that to the party platform, thereby keeping attention on abolition and slavery, not only in Ohio, but nationally, right as we were getting ready to go into the Civil War in 1861. Even our own historical agency, the Ohio History Connection, has an entire page devoted to the Black Laws of 1807. 
And it notes, among other things, that although slavery was not allowed in Ohio as part of the Constitution of 1803, most African Americans were not treated as equals to white people in the new state. And then it goes on to discuss um, some of those black laws that I've just mentioned. So as I hope this sort of brief discussion makes clear, if we want to teach Ohio students to be critical thinkers, to wrestle with difficult and challenging historical and contemporary social issues, and to assess the validity of competing arguments and evaluate their assumptions, then our students have to learn about and wrestle with precisely these kind of histories. But to do that, we need teachers who actually understand these histories and not the whitewashed versions of truth that Lisa Woods presents, which in one fell swoop erases 218 years of Ohio history. Now this brings me to the sort of the third part of what I want to talk about tonight, which is House Bill 322, 327. I'll focus on 327 tonight since it's the more broader of these two pieces of legislation. As I said, both of these were introduced in May of this year in the Ohio State House. There's been um, several hearings on both of them. The last one two weeks ago actually combined 322 and 327 um, together for the hearings because there were so many people that they didn't know how to manage it. And uh, the most recent one garnered a massive outpouring of opposition. Now, the first important point to note here is that um, if you follow Ohio news and media, prior to early 2020, critical race theory didn't really show up in the news. It wasn't something that anyone was talking about. They weren't writing about it. It just wasn't um, a headline topic for anyone. But thanks to the efforts of figures like Christopher Rufo, Mark Levine, and others, it increasingly became something that Ohioans were concerned about, as well as the influence of these sort of PAC networks generating more concern. The Ohio Census or the National Census data also played into some of those white fears about changing society, as did um, the racial justice movements in the summer of 2020 and continuing today. Now, based on my research of the last few years on this and related issues, um, I would describe anti-CRT advocates in Ohio and in many ways nationally as socially conservative and nationalistic. Some of them are Trumpian, some of them are America first nationalist, with a strong tendency to be religiously conservative, and many of them Protestant fundamentalists, although not only Protestants. They're predominantly suburban, particularly in Ohio, and middle or upper class, although there is an important rural working class component in Ohio as well. Um, but most importantly, the supporters of these bills are overwhelmingly white. Now, the political core of this movement fits into what religion scholars Samuel Perry, um, Andrew Whitehead, Anthea Butler, and others describe as white Christian nationalism. Whitehead and Perry describe Christian nationalism in their work as a kind of cultural schema or a collection of narratives, traditions, myths, value systems, and symbols which express a belief that America is distinctly Christian and that that idea and those values should be reflected in policy, symbols, and the national identity. They also identify two prominent sort of ideological commitments among white nationalists and particularly white Christian nationalists. First is an antipathy towards racial and ethno-religious minorities such as black Americans, immigrants, and Muslims. And two, the public promotion of an ideology that idolizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity and the American civic life. And as they note in the number of studies they published over the last 12 months, um, those sort of white Christian nationalists who adhere to these ideologies have stronger prejudices in all the surveys that they've done towards people of color, Muslims, non-Christians, and immigrants. And equally troubling, particularly given what we saw in January of 2021, there's kind of this surge of an increasingly militant white Christian nationalism tied to groups like the Proud Boys, the alt-right, QAnon, uh, all of which was on full display January 6th in the Capitol. Um, but importantly, some, a few recent studies in the last six months have shown that white Christian nationalists also have a greater tolerance compared to other whites for openly old school racist beliefs such as blacks being genetically inferior to whites. Right? So very, very old ideas that have been discredited for a long time. Now among the parents who were testifying in support of 322 and 327, overriding concerns, some of which I noted earlier, have to do with their children being exposed to discussions about implicit bias, institutional racism, white supremacy, white privilege, decolonization, xenophobia, sexism, classism, gender politics, and making sure that their students are not being exposed to or reading any kind of materials that touch on these topics or anything that might challenge the traditional Christian family, 
or capitalism as an economic system. All of these sort of issues in their mind are part of this broader kind of Marxist cultural agenda, social justice agenda um, that Rufo, Levine, and others have talked about. So what is actually in this 327 bill? The, really the kind of the heart or the core of this bill is this idea of divisive concepts. And essentially what the bill tries to do is to set out and identify a whole series of claims that cannot be discussed in the classroom, cannot be advocated or promoted in the classroom, in classroom materials, in classroom discussions as part of classroom assignments, or in any kind of training or employee related sessions for um, state employees or educational staff in schools. Some of these are relatively um, straightforward and others have a very deep kind of hidden ideological bias inside of them. So these A, B, C, D, and E are the first half of these. F, G, H, and I are the last half of these. And together, what these various divisive concepts attempt to do is to impose on public schools in Ohio, so that's K through 12, as well as public universities. So if we were having this conversation at somewhere like Ohio University, this bill would directly apply to us. As a private institution at Denison, we have some leeway to wiggle around these because we're not a state institution. And however, we are certainly part of this broader landscape of education in Ohio. And I'll touch on a few of these here in just a bit, but I wanna look at some of the other parts of this bill besides defining these divisive concepts. And I'll come back to those in a minute. So some of the restrictions that this bill also introduces is that schools can't teach, instruct, train, promote any kind of professional development or include divisive concepts or require students to advocate for or against any specific topic if they're taking class for credit. State agencies, school districts, teachers can apply for federal grants or accept private funding to develop curriculum, purchase or select curriculum, or even do teacher training and professional development if it touches on divisive concepts. And third, no teachers or administrators or school employees um, can be penalized, and this is important, for refusing to teach or believe or advocate or promote these same divisive concepts, and they don't have to go through any kind of professional training where they might be exposed to these ideas. So essentially they're getting a get out of free, uh, get out of jail free card to not even have to be exposed to these ideas and to be legally protected to sort of say, I don't have to be exposed to these ideas. Now a few things are kind of worth noting here. Because this bill covers school, state agencies, and other public employees, it throws an extremely wide net on those that are likely to be impacted. It also targets, without saying it, anyone who does diversity, equity, and inclusion training. So if you have a required class for freshmen at a university where you're addressing issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, this bill could potentially make those classes now illegal and the universities would have to pull those off of their books. And equally important, it creates this sort of protection for people who don't wanna be exposed to these concepts, don't wanna to have to address these concepts, or don't even want to think about these concepts to now have a legal right to essentially be excused from having to wrestle with them. But that's not all. Why stop there? Later on in the bill, it also introduces a series of financial and punitive punishments. So if you are a teacher or someone involved with the schools that is engaging with these divisive concepts in your class, and a report is made that you knowingly or willingly engage with these topics, or knowingly and recklessly as the law states, then the first offense could mean 25% of the funding being pulled from that school or that school district. If it happens twice, 50% of the funding can be pulled from that school or that school district. And it happens a third time, 100% of the school's funding or school district's funding can be pulled. So this is basically three strikes put into an educational context. But that's not all this bill proposes. Further on in section C part two, it also says that if the State Board of Education determines 
through some kind of a confirmed report that a student, parent, or teacher, or even a community member has recklessly or knowingly engaged in these issues. The first time a teacher is accused of this, they will be warned that they may lose their teaching license. Second time it happens, their license will be suspended. And the amount of time it will be suspended for is completely up to the discretion of the Ohio Board of Education. If it happens a third time, their license will be revoked entirely and you will no longer be able to teach in the state of Ohio for as long as the Board of Education determines that your license will be revoked. So not only does it create financial punishments, but it also has the ability to literally disbar teachers um, who are accused of or found to be engaging with these divisive concepts. But that's not all, there's even more. It prevents students from receiving classroom credit to graduate if they're in a class that promotes the divisive concepts. So if you took a class that promoted divisive concepts, you might lose credit and have to take another class. It also allows parents, guardians, or custodians of any student who feels that they have been subjected to, quote, indoctrination of divisive concepts in order to receive a class grade or graduation credit and opens up educators for civil actions against them because of that. And it states that violations of these by educators are not immune from civil liabilities if they are taken to court. So it creates a whole range of new legal and financial punishments that Ohio educators now have to worry about every day they're in class. Who's deciding if they're teaching a divisive concept or not and how will those be measured? Those are questions that the Ohio legislature still has not answered yet. Another key part of this bill is promoting the idea of meritocracy, the idea that we're all equal, all we have to do is work hard and we can all advance um, on equal playing grounds or sort of equal level footing. And specifically sets out a few things that can be discussed but only in an objective manner, such as the history of an ethnic group described in an approved textbook or instructional material, or the impartial discussion of controversial aspects of history, or the impartial instruction on the historical oppression of a particular group of people based on nationality, race, color, ethnicity, et cetera. So you can do these things, um, but you have to do them impartially. So you have to give an impartial history of indigenous genocide, or an impartial history of the Jewish Holocaust, or an impartial history of the enslavement of Africans. I'm not sure how you can be an educator and give an impartial history of the Holocaust. Um, but that's precisely what this bill um, says is our f remaining bit of freedom um, in the classroom. It also, by defining divisive concepts in a very specific way, it essentially puts a lot of areas out of conversation. So the, the idea that the United States is fundamentally racist and sexist the idea that an individual, by virtue of their individual nationality, race, color, ethnicity, religion, or sex, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same nationality, color, ethnicity, religion, or sex. So reparations is the immediate thing that comes to mind there. And the idea that meritocratic, uh, sorry, meritoc meritocracy or traits such as hard work um, ethics are racist or sexist or were created by a particular nationality, race, color, ethnicity, et cetera. So these ideas by defining them as divisive and off-limits, prevents any criticism or critical discussion of how these ideas came to be, how they continue to be maintained today, and who may or may not be responsible for making changes. Okay, so if you think about some of the things in Congress that are being debated, such as reparations, debates about land back and decolonization for indigenous communities, none of these would be able to be discussed because they've already been labeled sort of off um, topic as divisive concepts, which as many people have noted in their comments, the very definition of what is or isn't divisive is itself deeply ideological. But that embedded ideology is itself kind of wiped clean behind the veneer of a neutral law attempting to prevent indoctrination of Ohio students. So under the guise of preventing indoctrination, many people are arguing we're actually deepening processes of indoctrination in Ohio schools. Okay, so what does this have to do with broader global issues? 
few kind of final closing thoughts. About 52 years ago to this month, October 23rd, 1969, Stokely Carmichael, later known as Kwame Torre, spoke here at Denison, just down the road here in Slater Auditorium. Precisely to the importance of this critical education, he said, now as students, you know one of the jobs of your university is to ensure that you have an inquiring mind. Not only must it ensure that you have an inquiring mind, it must let you have a critical mind. When you find something you do not agree with, rather than reacting to that something, it's your responsibility to critically analyze it properly, inside and out, thoroughly, until you know properly what you are in agreement with. But by restricting the content of what is and is not acceptable on these arbitrary standards of divisive concepts, we are not allowing our students in Ohio, if this bill or these bills were to pass, to develop those critical thinking skills. But yet, these are precisely the kind of conversations that we need to be having at this particular historical moment in time, not just in the United States, but more broadly and globally. The second is, if you look more broadly about the diverse and important conversations that are taking place right now around the world, as well as in the United States around issues like police brutality, anti-black discrimination, anti-immigrant violence, all of these issues are deeply interconnected. So if we wanna understand, for example, the shameful treatment of Haitian migrants at the US border recently by um, border patrol guards on horses, or a European hostility to North African migrants crossing the Mediterranean, or European Union hostilities to Syrian refugees fleeing the Bashar al-Assad regime, we have to understand these broader histories. We can look at the current COVID-19 pandemic that we're all dealing with. How is it that less than 7% of the entire African continent, the entire African continent, has received a vaccine shot at this present time? Well, here in the United States, one single country, over 65% of our population has been vaccinated and over 56% has been fully vaccinated. We can't have intelligent conversations about these kind of interconnected global dynamics without talking about the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, scramble for Africa by US and European countries. And we similarly can't have an informed discussion about issues like police reform if we do not see these interconnected histories. And these are certainly issues that are not only relevant here in the United States. And finally, if we can't solve these problems facing the world today, expanding poverty, rising sea levels, growing political instability, and nationalist violence, are we gonna leave those to the next generation to try to solve? If we are serious about addressing them today, we have to get at the underlying material inequities at the root of these issues, which are an extractive economic system rooted in capitalist political and economic philosophies, white supremacy, settler colonialism, all of which are bad for both people and the planet. And we need to talk about how do we fight back against these interlinked systems of violence and oppression. Um, I put up a few examples of organizations here in Ohio that are working on these issues, both following the legislation and more broadly tracking these issues, all coming from a variety of different sort of perspectives, but all committed to promoting and encouraging a honest and accurate education in Ohio and also more broadly. So I wanna leave you with a, a final thought here from M. Jackie Alexander's wonderful book, Pedagogies of Crossing. She says, the desire to cheat for justice can only come from a place of hunger, an hombre de justicia, a desire to enunciate a mode of being that we live, analyze, and practice in our teaching and undertake in our research in as many ways and in as many places as possible. From a passion we are simply not willing to concede, from a passion that moves beyond the temporary comfort of demystification, to anchor teaching practices that are at once theoretically informed, agile, and accountable. Teaching for justice must come as well from understandings of history. Thinking justice, teaching for justice, and living justice means that we continually challenge each other 
to enunciate our vision of freedom. And that's what I hope we will continue to do here in Ohio and across the country. Thank you.